fellowship or daughters of the king or I'm not quite sure what the name is. So the well that'll do good. Okay, yeah. good. And then what's that last one? Coffee morning. Can't forget coffee morning on Friday. Okay. So usual plan, there is of course the plus, which in this case is the uh, men's Bible study. Uh, men being men, they start at 8 o'clock, not 7.30. Um, and that's Alan Jan's, Alan and Jan's house in Albany Road. I'm not sure where he's had word of the And the other thing that is ongoing, and it's lovely to be able to use that word, ongoing, it's happening, it's, it's going on at the moment, is the building work. If you can manage to get up the stairs at the back, we have a wonderful new ceiling in the cubby's room that's been done. Uh, still waiting after it's drying out to be painted and, and get the room sorted out colour wise, but that is the first job we've got completed. So there is no longer that wonderful hole for ventilation in the centre of the ceiling that has now been completely dealt with. Um, for those observant amongst you, that isn't the new crash over there. That is all the crash toys, cupboards, empty stuff, a, a variety of stuff put over there to, so that they can start work in the back room. The back room for the crash this morning is open and working, and thanks to Carol, there will be excellent teaching going on in there for the youngsters. So that, that is happening today. And of course, we've got the, the, the kids' corner in the back. If you even start to get restless, go and have a think. But um, that's there. Okay, that's just about all the most unless anybody else has anything else that they need to chat with me about. Good. Then we will move into our worship time. I'd like to welcome our worship. <laughs> yeah, therein lies the problem. We don't have a worship team this morning. Um, 17 of the Butlands and branches have disappeared off to Craig Arms in Shropshire. Um, and quite a few other people had said last week they weren't going to be here this week. They'd obviously had <coughs> trouble coming. And for some reason we do not have a worship team this morning. And we've only got, looking around, about two or three of us left. Appreciate 
as it says in Romans, the authorities are there given to us by God and we must respect them. And this is our opportunity to have an influence, potentially have an influence on those authorities. So let's pray first of all for the election. Father, we appreciate the fact that you have given us a system in this country whereby we can have a say in who governs us. And yet, so often it seems they're all the same, it seems they're in it for themselves, it seems an exercise in something that won't improve anything. On that Lord, it's because the people we're dealing with, that we're voting for, so often don't focus on the, your needs in this world. So Father, for all the candidates who are standing, for all the people, particularly all the people in this room now, who will be placing the vote, we pray that there will be a focus on you, that their policies will reflect your mercy, will reflect your justice, and will reflect a sense of a high authority above them that must be respected and acknowledged. So we pray for Parliament, Father, we pray for that building in Westminster. For all the seats to be filled in the next fortnight. And pray for that recognition of your position, your power over all, above all powers. And so when it comes to praying for peace, there will be a recognition too that it is the peace that you give, a peace we can't understand. Amen. And we pray for peace, Father. The peace that this world seems unable to give. So at a time when the world seems eternal, and we think of Gaza, we think of uh, Ukraine and other places around this world where all fighting seem to be the norm. Lord, we ask for peace. But we pray too, Father, for peace in our own hearts. Peace in our own families. And peace in our own spirits as we come to you and recognize what you've done for us. So in all these respects, Father, we pray and ask you to give us your Amen. Amen. And so, to our needs in this church, particularly want to raise the father in law of Sabini, the husband Steve's father, is not well. And the latest news she posted this morning was the pacemaker that's been fitted is not yet having the desired effect. And so things are not as they should be yet. So we pray for her and above all for him. And we pray for Carol Paul's family health, particularly for Lucas and Amy. As they expect a baby in September, and we ask that the help that they need, the help that is on offer, will be accepted. That they will be able to keep baby as a whole family, and that any families will be prepared to accept the support that is needed in that situation. So we pray for that.
and those have been off. <coughs> um, and I do is go by bus. So I ended up finding my seat on the bus very early on, and then just found nobody else was on the bus. I um, get right at the front, so I get to see Old Swan in all of its glory in the morning, and I get to read in this passage. Um, now, a lot of things have changed kind of throughout this um, six months for me. I started this new job in January, and two years later, I moved into a new flat, so it's a lot of excitement, a lot of new things. Um, but I felt definitely this sense of like, wow, there's a lot of change here. So I felt this passage um, was really necessary to just kind of go back to. And equally, I found myself with a lot of time to kill, given it's about an hour to get into work. And um, so I found myself kind of a bit bored, looking for something to read, and went back to an old book. Um, that I've read previously, but it's just a really good one, and um, it's called A Long Road Eats by Eugene Peterson. Um, and I felt pretty good when Pete came to speak in front line about not to go and brought the same book to us, um, so I knew I was on sort of one of them. Um, and this book references um, not Psalm 23, but a bunch of other psalms, and um, it references um, the psalms of the ascents, the songs of the ascents, which are Psalms 120 to 134. Now, as Pete beautifully laid out for us, and I won't do a good job as he did, but um, they were songs that the um, um, people of God basically sang as they went on to ascend up towards the temple at the top of the hill, and it was almost like a pilgrimage. And they sing them almost as a um, thing to just keep them going, this like slow plot almost. And um, I don't know if any of you are walkers, if any of you are runners or um, anything like that. Um, I've recently just got into running and went on a run recently, just yesterday actually. I found myself slowly plodding up this hill and thinking about my talk and going, yeah, walking up hills isn't always the most fun thing, but it's just this constant journey and stepping. And so I imagine that these, these songs were things that just kept them slowly stepping along and slowly going. And I feel like, man, is it so true that sometimes the whole faith journey can feel a bit like a slow plot, and sometimes when we don't have the songs to sing, when we don't have the to focus on, it can just feel like we're just putting one step in front of the other and just going. And I think in daily life I've definitely felt that in, in working, um, stepping into a nine to five, that some days I'm just like, I'm just, I'm just going, I'm just going. And that's just where I'm at. Um, but the whole point of these songs, these psalms, um, is to bring us back to a reminder of who God is. That God's character is that he likes to be in the middle of where we're at too. Um, he's a good, good father. Um, and that's kind of like the message and the reminder that I wanted to bring up today, that he is a good father and he knows where we are too. And it is true that as we slowly plot, as we slowly go, as we slowly go on this pilgrimage or whatever of, of our faith journey, it's very obvious and possible to see little fingerprints and little dots of God as we look back through our lives. I mean, that's true for me um, and it's worth just sharing that. So these songs have led me to recognize these truths um, and four of these truths are kind of like the basis of this talk um, and so it kind of links Psalm 23 very closely with one of these psalms that I'm going to bring up in a sec. And these four truths are that God is my daily peace, he is true, he is for me and he will not change. So God is my daily peace, he is true, he is for me and he will not change. So going back to this book, um, I was reading through it on my journey to work and a portion of it just really stuck out and I don't know if any of you guys have this, that when um, you feel like God really speaks something to you, whether it's just like uncomfortable and easy, it just kind of hits. This specific word stood out and it's in Psalm 122 um, and to set the seed of this psalm, um, it's speaking about the joy of almost wanting to go up and praise God at the temple. And I'll be reading from the NLT where it says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And now here we are, standing inside your gates of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a well-built city. Its seamless walls cannot be breached. <coughs> All the tribes of Israel, the Lord's people, make their pilgrimage here. They come to give thanks to the name of the Lord, as the Lord requires of Israel. Here, standing, stand the thrones where judgment is given, the thrones of the dynasty of David. Pray for peace in Jerusalem, may all who love this city prosper. I love the verse 7. O Jerusalem, may there be peace within your walls and prosperity in your palaces. I'm just going to stop it there. And this book highlights into the word prosperity. Um, so I'm just going to read that verse again. O Jerusalem, may there be peace within your walls and prosperity in your palaces. Now this word prosperity is a book highlighted was this Hebrew word shalva and um, it tends to be in Hebrew the language that it was written in that 
Um, it tends to have more than one English translation, more than one word that generally connects. Um, and so Shalva means prosperity, as we see in the, in the chapter. Peace, it means prosperity, peace, security, abundance. And the last one being quietness. Now this stood out to me, this word quietness, because when I think of the word prosperity, my first link is always quietness. I find it quite surprising. For me, when I think of prosperity, I almost don't think of quietness, I think the opposite. My head naturally goes to abundance almost. It goes to um, someone or something prospering, um, increasing, growing exponentially. I think of movements, I almost think it being quite loud. I don't think of quietness. I do not think of quietness in this. Quietness, I find for some, um, they don't mind it, it's okay. And for some, they absolutely hate a bit of quietness. And the people who hate quietness don't really understand as to why some people can actually enjoy it. Some people find it just very awkward, and there's someone who doesn't mind a bit um, awkward silence, just whatever else. I don't, I don't mind it particularly. Now, as I said, I moved into a new flat um, during January with my flatmate Sam, who I met during university, um, and our attitudes to quietness are polar opposites. Um, I learned this during university, especially during COVID times, where I learned after a long day of sat in front of a computer screen on Zoom that if I wanted a bit of peace and quiet, the place to go was not the living room. I found that if it was going to be the living room, it was going to be a anecdote or a story or a joke, it was not going to be a bit of silence, so I had to just accept that. So Sam hates the silence, my flatmate, I don't mind it, we're polar opposites in that way. And I'm very sure that if, I, if he was sat here, if I was to say silence and quietness link and peace, all of those linked together, he would probably say, no, nah, mate, that's not for me. <coughs> And yet, to bring it back to this passage, here we are with the word shalva, may there be peace and prosperity slash quietness in your palaces. And so bringing it back to Psalm 23, the, origin, the original point of this, this talk, Psalm 23, very early on, it goes and speaks about green pastures, quiet waters, and lacking in nothing. Quietness of shall for many, it's awkward and uncomfortable because there's no distraction, there's no avoidance. It's hard to be quiet, still and steady with ourselves, especially before God, without thinking of um, a little job or a little thing that needs doing or a little worry. And especially if we're not in a place of peace, that can be all that clouds our minds. And I know that's been true for me at points, especially in the last six months of where I've needed God's peace. Um, what fills my head is not the peace at points, it's this like, worry or myth. And yet, the quietness spoken in verse 2 describes the rest in place. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside quiet waters, he refreshes my soul. The place of relaxation and replenishment. And suddenly for me, God being our rest in place, a place of quietness, makes a lot more sense to me. It's a place to keep going back to. And just a very human example of this is something as simple as sleep. So, once again, um, as I would say that um, someone from there spoke about this, also brought up sleep, so I was like, oh, this is great. Um, but the idea of sleep each day is to um, refresh our bodies. It's physically in place, so our minds, our bodies can be refreshed for the next day. It's something to rinse and repeat. It's something to go back to constantly. And I'm sure if you're someone who struggles with a bit of sleep at the moment, that you're very aware it's like, wow, I just wish I had a bit more of this. I wish I had a bit more of this rest. And so in a similar way, we should be and are re rested and renewed by God each day. He is our constant source of rest, restoration, quietness and prosperity. And so you might be sat here going, this is all great and it's nice and it's a nice song, but I don't feel rested, I don't feel restored, I don't feel renewed. Now, I've been challenged by this passage because Faithfully, I've, I've been doing Christianity, I've been following Jesus since I was about 16. That was when I kind of made that decision. And over this time, and especially at this point, I've had enough um, experience of God to know that what he says is true, both scripturally and through my experience, that God is good and he is who he says he is. Even if I don't feel it and see it for myself, is God peace and prosperity? And my answer is yes. Just as a testimony, faithfully I trust and hope in a God who has done it before for me and will do it again and is calling me just to step towards him in a bit of act of obedience. And this, as I said, is either an act of obedience or a bit of trust. And as I was like, preparing my notes for this, I was looking over this and I wrote blind trust at first. 
um, as an act of obedience or blind trust. But I stopped myself and I didn't write blind because it is a blind trust. Personally for me as a God who's brought me immense joy, after seasons of loneliness, after seasons of sadness, he's brought me out of that. He's a God who restores my identity constantly, who continues to affirm me and show me who I am. He's a God who generally takes me on the right path, who guides me as a father does. So it's not blind trust because it's faithful trust. About a month ago, um, I was um, meeting up with one of my friends from church um, and we were going on a little walk and we were talking about the character of God and the idea of God being a father. And I was kind of like, in some ways, getting my head around the idea of God as a father. And my friend Will, who I was going on this walk with, um, brought up this analogy of um, a parent helping a child to walk for the first time. And in a similar way, as we see through this passage, as God walks alongside us, um, when a parent first helps a kid to walk, they very much pull them up. They um, take their hands and guide the child because the child doesn't know how to walk themselves. But over time, the child learns how to walk slowly, starts taking a few extra little steps. And that doesn't mean that the parent is nowhere to be seen. It doesn't mean that the parent's no longer there. It could be in a similar way like riding a bike. But the parent is very much involved and helping the kids. And even when the child can walk for themselves, the parent is still there. It doesn't just, once you walk, suddenly have everything in place. No. There's this idea of a parent, a father figure, being there, guiding. And as God does, I was speaking to um, Will again, one of my friends, saying about, um, he has this um, idea of like coincidences that God likes to do sometimes, where um, you have these conversations about God, about the character of God, and then these little coincidences happen, where um, practically you see it lived out. And um, it's very much not a coincidence at all. God is very much in the midst of teaching us lessons through just living life and in a faithful journey with him. And the very next day, I was hanging out with um, family from church who had a little, little boy who's um, just turning one, and he's the most active one you all have ever met. And um, he uh, is just learning how to walk, holding himself up on any surface, knocking everything over. Um, and I was out in the garden um, with him and his family. Um, I got the absolute privilege of just helping him to walk for the first time and he was making these little like joyful noises as he was going because he's just like such an active mover and he was just taking these little steps and just loving it and as I was doing this it just brought me back to the day before and so funnily how God's just brought up this, this conversation to them into this image of yeah he's just taking these little steps he's just finding joy in it and slowly over time I was able to just see him and will continue to see him take more and more steps by himself and I would need to be there, his mum and dad would need to be there or learn to walk. And it's just a little reminder of the goodness of God as a father. How true it is that God guides us, holds our hands at first but doesn't disappear shortly afterwards. I'm bringing it back to the passage in verse 3. He renews my strength. He guides me on right paths, bringing honour to his name. And the last line in that, that all of this is to glorify him. As he guides us, we glorify him. It's not in our strength and effort, it's not through our own strength of how much and how well we can walk by ourselves, but it's because he's working through us and in us. And that's why I think it's going to be great that we're going to be doing communion, because it just reminds us again exactly why we're doing this. It's through Jesus and the cross that all of this is, is possible. And so faithfully I stand here knowing that God is my daily peace, he is true, he is for me, and he will not change. And I say that saying that in the last six months, as I've alluded to, that on certain days I haven't felt like that. For days and some weeks I've felt like I really wanted the peace, but it hasn't been practically tangibly felt. And so my question during this time has been, well if this isn't true for me today, is it better to see this passage in Psalm 23 as a promise for the future? He will make me lie down in green passages. He will like lead me beside quiet waters. He will refresh my soul. But if we look at the text, that's not what it says. It's a present tense. He lets me rest in green meadows, not he will let me rest in green meadows. I see Psalm 23 in a lot of ways as a promise for renewal. There isn't a finite end to God's offers of Psalm 23. There's not one day we get it and then it's sorted, it's fixed. It's a, it's a constant, constant thing that moves on and continues to meet with us where we're at. And it's a weird thing to wrap my head around as someone who likes to plan, who likes to think ahead, who likes to be in control. 
that um, God is someone who is both here present in the today and also someone who is in the future and in the past as well. That he's there for me tomorrow as much as he is today. And this Psalm 23 is something that I can access both today and tomorrow. Mm. I'm not sure if you've heard of the phrase, um, a come back to Jesus moment or a come to Jesus moment. Um, I listen to a podcast, I'm a big um, American football fan. Um, and if there's anyone in the room who is, um, there's like a podcast called Around the NFL that it has a cool British following or whatever. Um, and one of the phrases that the hosts use is this kind of colloquial phrase of a come back to Jesus moment. And it's just casually used as a almost like a realization, a, a, a change of mindset, a realization, a change of behavior. And it does make me laugh when this is kind of brought up because it's, uh, it just reminded me of this, of this passage that. Um, I'm constantly being brought back when moments where my mind strays, where it goes into overdrive, where I'm worried that he's just constantly renewing me, bringing me back, re- resting me. And so if I, really, I really do believe that if we're coming from a place of knowing God as a true God, as a good father who walks alongside us, as a God who keeps his promises, he can offer me rest today, very practically. That's an invitation from a loving father. One who walks behind us, with us, all the same. I see Psalm 23 as an offering to us, a chance to rest, to be refreshed and restored by God. Here in Psalm 23 it makes me stop in my tracks and makes me almost come back to where Jesus is. Verse 2, he lets me rest in green meadows, he leads me beside peaceful streams, he renews my strength. And so with this, um, I really see an opportunity as we are going to take communion to um, bring it back to Jesus. Um, but before we do, I wondered if it was possible for us to kind of stop and to wait. And so um, we spoke a little bit about peace and it's something that I think we all require in either large or small amounts. And so I uh, would ask in this moment for you to kind of get a little bit comfortable, maybe close your eyes. And I want to kind of bring it back to where Jesus is. And so I'm going to pray. And we're just going to leave a bit of quiet and a bit of silence. It's so almost ask God um, what you say through this. So yeah, Father, I thank you that you are a good, good Father. Thank you for the promise of Psalm 23. Thank you that you are a Father that renews, that restores, and that brings practical peace to our hearts, Father. We ask for your Holy Spirit to rest in this place, to bring that peace that you promise us. It was the writer of the Hebrews who explained very clearly just what Jesus' sacrifice means to us all in our This is Hebrews 10. By God's will, we have been made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And yet, every priest stands day after day serving and offering the same sacrifices again and again. Sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, he sat down at the right hand of God, where he's now waiting until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are made holy. Which is us. Let's pray. God of grace, we thank you that it is through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus, that our sins are forgiven and that we are put right with you, that we can call you Father and receive your peace, be at peace with you and our love. So as we eat this bread, we remember again the words Jesus gave us. This is my body broken for you. And we ask you to remind us that we are all part of Jesus' body, alive through him and moving for him. Amen. So let's share the bread.
symbol of our unity in Christ. Thank you, Lord. Let's just close and pray. Lord Jesus, fill us with your Holy Spirit to be effective as your church here on earth. Give us the strength to do the work you would have us do and to be the people you would have us be. And we ask you to build us together into people of power.